Can I? But, but I was, you know, we'll also bring up that this is, we're live Uh-oh. now too. So welcome to Vlog Thursday 320. Um, I messed up my light. Yeah. That got bright. So I see already people are talking about it. So who's getting roasted today? Last pass is getting roasted today. Because they should know better. They certainly can afford better. They're they're a well-funded company, so that's not the problem. Um, but ah, uh, this is this is gonna be fun. We have security stuff to talk about. I didn't I really didn't take the time because I was like, how much more detail do we have about LastPass? I wasn't even gonna do a video on it, but after it I seen it, I'm like, they did what? So the, I already made a whole separate video where I dive into it deeper, but we'll at least bring it up here. And me and Steve, uh, we frequently tell clients not to do this, is you don't get to use your personal computer for your important business things. Um, I think you had one of them that they wanted to share it with their kids. No, I had one. She got let go because of it. Um, oh, okay. She got mad because we loaded all of our MSP software on the laptop. When I went into their office... And it was part of the condition that she wanted to work from home. They said, okay, we'll load all the stuff on the laptop. She got mad. Well, you have this and that, and you could see what I'm doing. I'm like, yeah, it's a work laptop. Me and my ma share that laptop, and she uses it for her banking. And I'm like, but you're logging into work stuff. It's a work laptop. You shouldn't be doing that. Yeah. And she wanted all the stuff removed from it. I went right to the owner's office. Hey, she wants all the stuff removed for the security from her, the laptop she wants to work from home with, and the owner looked at her, then you can come in and do work. You don't get to work from home then. Yeah, it was, it's, it's a really simple thing, but it's a big deal. There's, there's reasons yeah. for separation. And when you get all the way to the size of LastPass, like they have very few people have, un, as they should, unfettered access. So you, you've done the proper thing at LastPass and saying, not everybody can have full access to the database, just a few people. But then, oh, that's all right if they load Plex on their laptop or we're not watching that. I don't know. So that was definitely um, something that sucked. Uh, oh, the, um, yeah, the other thing too. So this is, I, and I, I won't go too far into this because I have a whole video on it. I even have a Reddit post uh, on this topic, which why not just in case anyone wants to join in the commentary on Reddit. Um, where'd that one go? I think it's this Reddit post. Oh, yes, one. Yeah. Uh, on the S1 thing. So I, I did two things. I did a video, but I did the too long. I know some of the MSP market just wants the details in writing. So I took the time to type it up as well. Um, I'll throw this link in there. It's it's Reddit R MSP and currently the top post. And uh, oh, that wasn't good. Hold on. There we go. Started zooming on me. Um, but all it is is that you know, Huntress found something, Sentinel-1 missed it. I deep dive into it in a 17-minute video. I write, wrote it up here. This is just a more abridged version. But yeah, Sentinel-1 missed, uh, Huntress hit, and security's hard. Um, so I don't really need to rant about it. <laughs> it's I've already done that part. And I don't like to just rant. I like to be very concise on it. And Steve helped me with this particular investigation. So he's familiar with it as well. We both agreed. Apparently, <laughs> well, you're like, you're like, yeah, this sucks. Uh, Sentinel One's answer sucks. I mean, oh no, their answer completely sucks. Yeah. it's all I. You did the deep dive into what happened. I just removed the thing. <laughs> yeah, I did all the forensics on the back end of really trying to answer the question. I mean, Steve did the removal part of it. So, um, what? Uh, oh, it's something I didn't. Let's get. Uh, we're getting things out of order because we were just ranting about like it's been a series of security things lately. Uh, but we'll back up a little bit. We're going to talk about Cisco Small Business shortly. I always like to address that, yes, and I didn't throw it up on the screen here. Um, we are taking questions still, and that's been going well. Uh, vlog Thursday at lawrencesystems.com, so they find out where that button is to make that show up, so I can throw it back on there. I've lost it now. Where is that at? I don't know. I don't have the button because I'm not I not signed in. And uh, I because yeah. again, separation of things. I am yeah. not signed into my work account on the com- on my nice computer with the webcam and the nice microphone. It's under banners, not under thing. I'm going to make some custom graphics for us. We're going to get fancier soon. Ooh. Anyways, I know I'm going to start using OBS for some of this because I, there's I, I learned from uh, Jeff at Craft Computing some cool fancy things you can do to bring multiple feeds into OBS and then do cool overlays with graphics. Um, I yeah. I, I, I've learned things, but 
<laughs> back to um we'll answer a question here because i like when people throw uh donations here and we got grayson if i'm an employer or head of it department allowing employees to use their own uh, computer as work would be a security nightmare it is and people well, want to do it and this was this was unique because this was actually before covid so before everybody was going home um this was i think 2018 2019 and she just wanted to do some of the office work because she couldn't get in. She couldn't make it there some days or something. So it wasn't even like a you. It wasn't like a oh you have to work from home thing where we saw that complete pivot into. And, and we went through a lot of that actually at the start of COVID. The complete pivot of employees trying to hunt down laptops and webcams, and then everybody having to get firewalls with VPN support so they can get to the stuff at the office. Yeah, bring your own device does not make a lot of sense. Um, I don't understand the last pass stance on that. It doesn't make a lot of sense to me, and it doesn't make sense to uh, even at smaller companies that we're dealing with. We're not, we don't have any clients, as, I don't think. Well, I know it's a big clients, but we're not managing all their security. If I was managing security for a client the size of last pass, <laughs> I would have some strict policies. <laughs> um, the little red, I tried to get out of the way, but we were four minutes, six minutes in. So we'll jump back to it. I try to answer people's questions and I try to say where I'm going to be. I have officially signed up for MSP GeekCon. So anyone who's going to that event, yes, I'll be there. Um, Cause I kept being wishy-washy about it. So uh, that's definitely a thing. Um, the next is two questions I'll answer, which are weird that they came in. They're from different people, but they're almost, they're very similar questions. Uh, it's about sync thing. I'm going to do a new video on sync thing. My old videos on sync thing are still pretty relevant. Sync thing's a cool little tool. Um, and they were asking about, does it handle file conflict? And the answer is yes. If uh, me and Steve, and we do actually use sync thing, uh, if we're using it and we're both not connected, uh, the computers are offline and we both modify the same file, it'll create a conflict version of the file. Uh, it'll determine who edited one last, but it'll create a conflict version because they were both edited at the same time without being synced. That was question A. And question B was, um, should I expose sync thing to the internet? Certainly not the management ports, um, but there's not any known vulnerabilities in SyncThing at this time. But if there are in the future, that is something you will have to concern yourself with. So I think they do a good job on security. But the moment you publicly expose something, there's no known vulnerabilities in Plex. I wouldn't. <laughs> but I wouldn't. But I cl wouldn't. clearly Plex appears to be in the last crash breach how they got in. So um, there's not a vulnerability in Oh, there's always a vulnerability we don't know about. We just don't know when someone's going to find it. That's how I feel about everything. So uh, I don't recommend. And those are those only two questions we had that came in um, that I seen on the vlog. I so. would think about it like this. Think about the number of vulnerabilities in the last couple of years that we find out have just been part of the way something was designed and been there for the last decade. Mm -hmm. And then just no one noticed. So there's no known, but that doesn't mean that there's not something there. Right. Um, how do you prevent employees from uh, using the company VPN, OpenVPN, from being used on a personal computer? Um, I mean, it's not that hard. You Generally, the employees don't have the installer or have access to it. I wouldn't give it to them. We usually install it for them. I mean, it doesn't mean they couldn't reverse engineer the work computer um, and pull the certificates out of the work computer and load it on their personal computer. It's not – it's not – an impossible task, um, but I'm sure it's a fireable task if they were doing it. Uh, if it, my, my wife is an example of this. She has to do everything over the VPN. She works for a financial firm. Um, if I were to extract the uh, VPN off of her computer, I have a feeling it would lead to some agreement breach that she's had not to tamper with it. So um, it's more of a policy thing. It's not, this is not where the problem usually comes in. It's not usually the employees loading it. It's almost them asking to get it loaded. There's always going to be some exception. It's, it's hard to do because like OpenVPN doesn't have any security locking to the computer itself. Um, but it does install certificates. So as long as someone doesn't try to lift the certificates off and install it somewhere else, uh, I imagine some VPN tools are out there that probably validate differently um, with the computer to make it harder to extract them. But OpenVPN doesn't, not that I know of. You don't have any better idea on that one, do you, Steve? No, no. Uh, hire trustworthy people. 
Yeah, it's it's not it's it's Why that's are the an ones edge case. who who uh, skirt the system. Yeah, and I'm gonna say that's an edge case. I don't think we've ever had an employee who um, had a work computer and took the VPN and loaded on a personal computer without telling us. No, fact, they're it, usually really good about it, and even um like hey i need the open vpn but while you're at it i am using this for work load all your stuff yeah so that's um like that i that i know of open vpn doesn't support tpn key stores i mean that's a way to i mentioned some vpns that do um the generic open vpn to my knowledge um doesn't support tpm key store that's a way to do it you could validate it against the tpm key and say you can't leave this computer but it's such an edge case um it's it. I mean, if I was the size of LastPass, I would be looking for a VPN that maybe did some high level authentication. That way, no one could ever extract the keys as a threat actor extracting it. Um, but a threat actor extracting the keys to do that doesn't. I don't think I've seen too many reports where that was the methodology they got in. No, instead they use Plex. Hey, why would you do that when there's Plex? <laughs> every day, like uh, probably every other week, we get. Yeah, I have a QNAP and I want to run Plex and I want to port forward it to the world. Please don't. Please just don't. No. <laughs> yeah. It's just one of those things. It's just, you're going to have problems. Just, uh, just keep everything behind VPNs. Now, even though I have publicly exposed my NVR, but I have a whole video about why it's on a separate VLAN, why mm -hmm. that VLAN can't access my other network. So there are circumstances where it is greatly convenient for me outside where I should even say my wife, because I don't leave the house as much as she does, <laughs> to be able to view the cameras and not have to use that relay. Because when you use a relay with Synology, it goes slower. So you would like to, you publicly expose it. There's direct connection. Awesome. It goes faster. But I'm aware there could be a flaw found in the Synology system that gets attacked and then that would be the end of my nvr but my nvr runs constant backups the configuration's backed up so i would reload it and shrug my shoulders about the incident um and i would go well that sucked but it couldn't go anywhere it got to the network and that's where it dead ends so um if you install i was just uh, responding to that yeah if, i mean they technically you can by default, mm. no, and it is, don't do it because it's a bit of a security mess. You can create an auto login by saving the <laughs> password and username <laughs> in a text file, telling the OpenVPN config reference that text file, and then telling the service to auto start. It will then run OpenVPN as a service and connect before you even log in. Yep. And don't do that. <laughs> uh, tail scale is an option as well. So can these things be done via tail scale? Interestingly, if you were to do this via tail scale, you would end up with a different problem. If someone were to try to copy and install it somewhere else and that computer was online, you would have a conflict. And I think it would break tail scale because you'd see two uh, nodes with the same identification. I don't think you would authorize a second node. I've never tested this, but I have a, a guess that maybe this might be something I play with. Um, build a tail scale node clone it because i can do them in linux just do a vm clone real quick boot it up and see what which one wins the first one the second one they're a clone of each other um you know can you extract a key and reinstall it will it accept that key because tail scale is like a challenge response you like hey i would like to authorize and then you go in the dashboard and you go hey i authorize you to uh be part of this tail scale network so um uh, tail scale is a cool solution for that mm. um do you push backups from MBR or do you pull backups from MBR? How do you keep any backups from accessible via lateral east-west movement if there's a breach? Um, you you a can pull them. You yeah. can do a pull. We have a client saying uh, they have some mills that only do SMB1 mm. because mills, <laughs> um, like big machining mills. And so there's a computer on that network that they can use to push files to the mills and lathes that has to have SMB1. That network has no internet access, and there's a script on the server that does a pull to back those files up. Yeah, there's ways you can do it like that. So, um, and because I don't back up the um, the recordings, I don't usually care. So I don't I don't have any. I just don't. Why waste the space of duplicating all my recordings? They, there's those I don't back up. It's really only configuration that I back up, and uh, it's just a. a it reaches out and backs it up once a week because I don't change it very often. 
Uh, so it's not a big deal. Someone just mailed us a question. I think this is a good one, Steve. Uh, any chance on how often you do backups to a cloud destination where backup storage is uh, more cost an issue? And that one's actually kind of simple. You do incrementals. You do the full backup the first time, and sometimes you have to do a seed backup if you're bandwidth limited. But after that, you just do incrementals. This is actually the challenge of finding backup software that does this properly. Yeah. Um, we're currently using uh, MSP360 because we had trouble with different mm -hmm. software, but it's all about incremental backups. That's the only way you, if not, you're going to kill yourself in bandwidth. Yeah. Yeah. We actually have a, because we had to change the way the backups worked a bit, we would do a full one every week. Client only has enough bandwidth that it takes a week to do the full backup. Yep. Yeah. It's a, uh... Ah, it's a pain, but it's uh bandwidth limited clients are still a thing. There's some areas that just don't have um the extra backup stuff. Uh, let's see. Oh, um, I actually give a shout out. Someone just emailed us and what's a good software for employee monitoring? Um, Zoros, we have a video on it on this channel. So we use Zoros. Zoros has a employee monitoring tool. Um, so I'll throw that out there. I just did a video on it. You'll find it on my channel, Z-O-R-U-S. Why backup recordings? If you ever capture anything interesting important, you should be, you should get backup. Look, this is at my house, so I'm not. And I'm not saying I'll do it for clients. I'm saying at my house, ain't nothing that interesting. Um, it's in a raid array, so even I'm not most, worried. Yeah. Yeah, even most clients don't back it up. It's, it's too much data is the problem. That's, it's, it's. I mean, I have extra storage. I could wear out more storage by doing it. Sure, why not? I have the storage. I have the bandwidth. Do I want to just burden it, backing up all those recordings that I mostly have squirrels running around? <laughs> That's what I have. I love to get the notification. Oh, there's a rabbit in my backyard. Neat. I'm going to watch that for a bit. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> it's just not, yeah, it's not, it's not really worth it. It's one of those things. Hmm. Um, Let's see, do we think we we'll give we'll do a few more questions and we'll start talking some of the Cisco stuff? Um, I just got a letter from Frontier and Muskegon. They're going to offer fiber provider here, ninety dollars for one gig, one gig. Yeah, there's a few pockets up north. Um, mm -hmm. my cousin has this. It's just like weird. They have these weird spots. Like you're in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, we have one gig symmetrical. What? What? How do you? You're in the middle of freaking muskegon like if anyone doesn't know that's not a i mean there's some people in muskegon it's not a bad place i'm not dumping on it i'm just saying it's not the most it's not the biggest city in michigan 90 percent of people live within what about 50 miles of detroit that's the most of michigan is lives in the, the tri-county area yeah lives within the tri-county area the mm -hmm. area around detroit grand rapids is another pocket ann arbor's a good college town but muskegon's yeah. up north once you a little bit in lansing yeah a little bit in Lansing. Once you go up north, it's a beautiful place. I recommend you visit it, but you'll also <laughs> like it because there's very few people there. <laughs> uh, has Unified Router OS improved multi WAN capabilities? I seriously doubt it. Uh, do you know if they've ever fixed the failover to work properly, Steve? No, it still checks against um, whatever they tell it to check against. To my knowledge, you still can't change it. And you'll just get random. Yeah, I couldn't ping it for a second, so I failed over even though the internet wasn't out. Yeah. Yeah, weird. And don't add a third one. It'll break. Looks for property. You, Yeah. if You know, the internet does drive where you live. I, mm -hmm. I kind of wanted, before I got this house, um, I kind of wanted to live in a rural area. But I would check if the internet was even available. Um I think I mentioned before there was that building we looked at uh, briefly over on here on River Drive until we found out we couldn't get internet there. We're like, oh, yeah. yeah. The guy wanted to give me a really good deal on the building, and I wanted it, but I was like, there's no good providers here. There's only one. It was, uh, what's that other provider that's in Flat Rock? I can't remember her name. Spectrum? Spectrum. Yeah. One Spectrum connection going down a rural road. I'm like, yeah, that's that's a disaster waiting to happen. We actually are lucky. We can we have a lot of connectivity at our office. Yeah. Canada, I'm jealous of. I got a client in Toronto who was just like, yeah, I bought two 2.5 gig connections. They were only like $70 a month each. <laughs> cool. <laughs> it turns out Ben hates people, so it works out. So oh, he's in the right place. 
That's why my family lives up north. So one gig, one gig in Alberta, Canada. Mm-hmm. You, That's you got snow, up there. Canadian geese, polite people, and one gig internet. <laughs> yep. Uh, did I hear you say to a fullback and incremental after, would you be concerned about possible corruption? It depends what software you use. How much do you trust that software? Um, in any backup, any full or incremental untested backups are wishful thinking. You have to do a DR test once in a while. Um, that's, that's how you validate is some regular pattern of DR testing. That's the only way. Uh, if not, you're just even full backups. Cause I mean, we've had problems with full backups. There's, there are challenges we've run into with software, um, and debugging it. So it, and it was, we, we had, uh, a lot of this has been fixed, but we had some problems with the early Ninja One backups. I won't. I'll, I'll just say, be honest about the product. We love the product, but their backups were not um, not favorable when we tried them. They've been a lot of reengineering to fix them, and we had a full backup that it, it got to restore. But it turns out, was it like you had to use it on a single threaded processor or something stupid? Mm -hmm. That bug's been fixed, by the way. I know that whatever that bug was, they, I, they I, had a few bugs. Like they couldn't get the restore to work properly. They never did answer my math problem question like <laughs> in a way that i thought actually answered it um and then it would do the restore but it would like fail to restore the partition because it would do that last so the data was there but not usable by a uh operating system yeah so there's it's it's that dr test that gives you confidence in your product that's that's the only like real answer to the problem if you don't do the dr test whether it's a full backup or incremental the problem still exists mm -hmm. and of course uh cody going canada for the win yeah, i want to go to canada i want to move to canada go hang out with cody he can do wiring jobs i'm coming back <laughs> <laughs> oh i was gonna say this is brought to you by liquid death I like this. This is the uh, green one. They're not a sponsor at all. I just, I, I just, just like them. Stuff. I know I didn't link. I, I like it. Them. I thought it was a gimmicky marketing, but I actually kind of like their drinks. So, uh, let's see. Uh, someone says that you can change what it pings now. I'm assuming they're talking about the UDM. Well, that's yeah. cool. That's a good thing. I'm, I'm with that. So, I guess the next question. Um, it's going to be, make sure I have a message from my cousin. Everything's all right. Cool. I have a, a family from out of town in town. I told them they can call me if they need me. They just message me and they don't need me. So anyways, <laughs> um, let's see, is anyone else nervous about PF sense being the only reasonably priced multi-gig firewall solution out there? Uh, if they go out of business, the next compatible hardware costs thousands. Ah, no, I'm not that worried about it. They're, they're open source project. I don't think the project's going away. Um, dare I say, OpenSense exists, which can do this stuff as well. It's so there. <laughs> there's at least a, there's a plan B. And there's actually some other firewalls out there. Um, I can't remember. There's a, I, I haven't tested in a long time, but I know there's still, there's some, uh, maybe, I kind of want to play with one of them again because it's been so long, but I don't have the time. Is Indian still a thing? Oh, yeah, that's right. Let's look that one up. I think they sold to someone else. Oh no. I'll let's find out. I'm going to look at the version, but we'll, we'll look together here. Yeah. I'm looking oh. it up right now. Yeah. So it's still a thing. It still exists. Free open source UTM for home networks. Indian firewall community. So it looks like this still exists. At least the webpage exists. Yeah. Where's the download at the top. It says download. Oh. And it takes you to SourceForge. Okay. So they still have that one still available. Uh, last update, it's been almost a year. Well, 2022, I, 330. Yeah. That's not necessarily bad. No. Because it, it's the base OS. There's probably package updates after it. So. Uh, sh there we go. Still looks the same as when we used it mm -hmm. years and years ago. This is for a little while. We used this before PF Sense. Recommended projects: IP Cop, 
Yeah. <laughs> no. IP IP cop is dead, but I think IP fire is around. There's a couple other firewalls out there. They're, I don't know. Okay. I, I, they, you can still get the uh, untangle as well, by the way. So untangle, uh, Arista's not done anything bad other than, other than I, I'll, I'll throw Arista out there on this. Um, the, uh, they removed the free download without registration. You now have to register your home user edition. I think they don't charge for it, but you have to register it. I think that's, I don't think, or maybe they, I don't know. They did something with the free edition where you have to go through and like request the free edition now. Um, but so it's not like there's only an option out there. I didn't know Willie was a user. So Willie, how's the user of that as well? Huh? It was a good, it was a great firewall for a while. Like mm. Now we don't use this and people ask me about doing a video on it and it's just outside the scope. Um, Vios is a command line driven. Vios is really powerful. Uh, there's this guy that made these great videos on how to build a 10 gig switch with Vios. It's really weird because the guy doesn't really have much of a YouTube channel. He's got like four amazing videos that are very detailed of how to use Vios and they're well put together. They're well like, uh, animated and all the graphics. And then he didn't make any more videos. I'm just like, he just showed up out of nowhere, made these great videos on bios, the best ones on bios with lots of views, but there's not anything else on his channel. <laughs> yeah. Mono wall was the, was the before PF sense we had mono wall. So yeah, there's that. I want to do one of those, like, what is it? The old Linux, the LGR, how they do some of the old hardware. I want to, Maybe for April, uh, we're going to review an old firewall. We're going to have to find old hardware because it won't run on some of the new stuff. <laughs> uh, let's see. Now, do you have that Cisco stuff pulled up, Steve? Let's talk about that now. Cisco I small pulled business. up. Let me log into mine. Like the web panel for the yeah. AP? I don't have it plugged in. Oh, okay. What do you I think of it so far? Describe your testing with it. <laughs> um. Well... Watches use Wi-Fi. That was a lesson. Mm, yeah. Um, Steve didn't have a password on his Wi-Fi because, well, he has his Wi-Fi in the basement, so it's kind of like this upward funnel. Yeah. You're on my front lawn. I, I see you. <laughs> True. So in order to do the testing uh, with the issues Tom was having with it, with uh, WPA3, I had to move everything to a network with a password. In the process, I'm counting out all the things as I add them, and a mystery device shows up. Turns out my phone pushed the updated Wi-Fi password to my watch, which then used Wi-Fi and sent me into a panic of, what is this device on my network that just got on here? You know, I'm trying to log in. I'm not sure why the switch isn't responding now. It was working. Oh. It's now not happy. I can uh, do, 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 let me grab a box. It will plug. We were not pre as prepared as you wanted. I've been testing the switches. We're gonna we're, we're gonna do a more concise video review of it. Um, Green one. Uh, where did the Cisco go? Is it my demo lab? There we go. I found the IP address. I bet that I looks like I have the wrong IP address. I don't know why. Okay, plugged in. It was still oh. sitting there. I just I needed the uh, long thin cable. I originally had it on. Yeah. So we'll log into the switch. Uh, where's the password for it? Oh, it good. Good news. It's in Bitwarden. It makes me change the password from time to time, which is super annoying. And you get to see it, see it all in real time here. Yeah, we only got about five minutes for that AP boots. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's actually... Uh, this is a little aggravating. Yes. And then the other aggravating thing about it is when you make a change, it knocks the um, extenders offline. So if you're trying to make a change, like changing names, it applies the change, but doesn't actually send the thing. And you refresh the page and find out, oh, none of that took. Oh, actually, it's interesting. What do you have to do to the uh, extenders? You have to restart them? Uh, no, if you refresh the page, eventually it realizes it didn't rename them. And then you can try again. Now, the first thing I'll mention, 
besides the fact that this is incredibly slow. But these Cisco switches, and let's pull them up on Amazon. Actually, we pull up first the uh, Wi-Fi you're using on Amazon. Uh, that's the 140AC, right? Uh, was that the lower one of the two you gave me? Yep. Uh, yes, I didn't start the higher one. Yeah, the 140AC. Part of the reason I'm reviewing these is I, I am dumbfounded by this. For any of the complaints we have about it, the fact that you can buy a Cisco 140 AC for 85 bucks means it's an interesting, and it's in stock, by the way. So it's not just that they're claiming it's $84. It's the fact that you can buy this. It's an available product. And uh, it's a, let me zoom in a bit here. It's an enterprise grade because Cisco sticks that and everything. Um, yeah. Nemo two by two performance, delivering highly secure, and reliable wireless. Now, the highly secure part, sure. The the reliable is the part we're testing. <laughs> I I did get it working. It's the extenders that they offer that seem to be kind of a pain in the butt. Um, that's where we're doing a little bit of testing because. I, and I can't find this. You can find it on the Cisco site, but I don't currently see it on Amazon, but it was on Amazon before. Um, but nonetheless, this is actually a really good price for Wi-Fi. I, I, I'm shocked at how, um, and this is the part, um, no Telnet, probably does have Telnet, uh, no licensing subscriptions. Yes, a Cisco device that's affordable without licensing descriptions or subscriptions, you're like, whoa, <laughs> that's not the Cisco way. Like, does the legal department at Cisco, are they aware of this device? Have they heard about it? <laughs> how did this get past legal? <laughs> My concern uh, is how long do they add one? Yeah. Uh, and you do not need a controller. And you do not, it has its own web interface. So, yeah, no DNA uh, center tax on this either. I know. Now, you're supposed to be able to click, connect it to the Cisco dashboard. That was a big fail. I did a video on how garbage the Cisco dashboard is. No one should use the Cisco dashboard. They do say you can, can connect it to the Cisco dashboard. If you get support with Cisco and you say the right incantation, I'm, I'm confident you can get it to connect. Um, but then you also find it not particularly useful. And then it's just broken. So this is not a Meraki at all. So this is um, completely a uh, independent. You can set it up. Now, it does have that ability, as I said, to be tied to the Cisco dashboard. But when I do the review, I will just reference and gesture that there's a video that you should watch on the Cisco dashboard. So I still can't log into it. I think it's still booting. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The boot time on this thing is like five or six minutes. So there's there's that yeah the that, switch has a long boot time too the switch is kind of the same thing i i didn't like that at a client's i rebooted the switch i thought it wasn't coming back it took <laughs> seven eight minutes to boot and i'm standing there in a panic now like oh this is bad <laughs> yeah but we have a vlan configuration wizard so for those of you less familiar with vlans it's easier than not having one i'm not going to say it's good i'm not going to say it's a uh, unify level good but it works. So you can configure these interfaces. You can add some VLANs and IDs to it and apply it and uh, figure out what membership each of the ports are. And then it has a summary and you apply it. It's um, here's your trunk interfaces. So it's still going to use all the Cisco naming schema, but it works. It's it, I actually was able to do it. It even has an ACL wizard on it. Um, and the switch, the let's go search this one too on Amazon. So actually, let's send a link first. So uh, I still can't get into this thing. So <laughs> I'm still waiting on it. Like the web page will not load. It it takes a long time to boot. Yeah, it does. There's a link I threw in there for, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, the link for the Cisco 140 AC. And this is the uh, Cisco Business 350 here uh, that I'm logged into. Steve has the other one, but you haven't plugged it in, right? The 24 port? No, one? it's still in the box. I haven't made it that far. Mm. I was going to start with these, just one thing at a time. I can grab it. It's Well, I mean, here's the thing. Is it a 24 or 48 port? I don't know. 
again, it's not far. <laughs> yeah, the um, this is a Unboxed Cisco business. Video. Yeah, POD managed switch eight port, um, full POE uh, combo, and it does come with Cisco's limited lifetime protection. But three forty six, it's not off the, sh it's not crazy high priced. I actually think it's a reasonable. This is the model you have. Uh, two twenty series. CBS two twenty. 24p 4x 24p 4x yeah so here's a 24 port 10 gig poe switch from cisco for 700 dollars i mean from that's i, I don't, don't think know. that's I mean, are all the ports 10 gig no no, no not the... all the ports only the uh these ports are so these are not but it is a poe switch so you get four 10 gig SFP pluses. But what's a Unify 24 Pro? The only Maybe. difference between the two would be two uh, 10 gig SFP ports at that point. That's actually probably, I think, similarly priced to the 24 Pro. So yeah. Yeah, let's pull it up and look. So I'm curious as well. So the Switch 24 Pro is sold out. It always is. Uh, no, there's a big price. Um, actually, no, wait, how many POE ports does this one have? No, that's the Switch Pro, that's not the POE one. Okay, we need the POE one, yeah, yeah. I don't like Unify's new standard for naming, yeah, because there's the POE Switch 24 POE. We need a Switch Pro, Switch 24. Pro, seven hundred dollars. Yeah, so it's the same. Same the Unify one is really close in price. The only it's difference not... is uh, two 10 gig SFP ports, and what is the power of the Cisco? Yeah, that's a good one. What's the power budget here? So we have 400 watt versus the Cisco, and does it have PoE plus plus support? Uh, let's see, 195 watt. Yeah, so you get. Half the power budget, and possibly we don't know if it has and no PoE plus plus. Right, and no PoE plus plus. So the Unify has eight ports of plus plus and double the wattage. Yeah, so not bad. I mean, no, they're this, pretty similar. That's the trade off. You lose a bit of power and PoE plus plus for yeah two ten two extra ten gig ports if you need them. And in Cisco, reliability is not what we complain about with Cisco. It's functionality and licensing and general uh, cost and yeah. So being in the same ballpark is not bad. So that's I, I think this is a reasonable um sway Cisco's having into this market. I don't I, I think it's a good thing. Not sure why Brett called. Mm. Uh, make sure it's something important. Doesn't look like it's important. All right, cool. <laughs> um, Aruba's uh, is no better. Too many variants. Instant on is the same as the IP campus, AP managed controller, but Aruba has far more features than Unify if you pay for it. You I mean, if you pay for it, because the standard Aruba instant on dashboard is way, way less good than the Unify dashboard. So I also hated when I tried to add a VLAN for a client, it wouldn't add it to the uplink port. Really? Yeah, I had to, I'm like, add this VLAN. And it was actually pretty easy. I It was able to, because I remember you saying it didn't have some functionality to like just mass add a VLAN when you used it. They did add that, but it didn't, it wouldn't add it to its uplink port. I don't know why it was, you had to go in and then manually do it on the uplink port for some reason. Weird. Yeah. That's, um, I don't know. Interesting thought experiment. Would you prefer Unify by Cisco or Cisco by Unify? Neither. Neither. I don't think those two people can get along. <laughs> and I, I just don't want to see either one of that at all. I didn't want to, I don't even want to run in through it as a thought experiment. Um, you know, I'll address this one head on. Uh, ordering Cisco from Amazon feels dirty and like a full on scam. Not really. And the problem is the vendors have made it so 
difficult to deal with them. What's that one company we really hate that we only buy because they have something in stock because they make me do the wire transfer stupid? Oh, Streakwave. No, not Streakwave. They're the, the other one that one Brett likes. One. Brett. The, oh, one, the Streakwave, you had to do the, you had to ACH stuff as well. But Streakway was easier to deal with. Yes. The other one that has a really hard quoting system too to get. Yes. To, but there's some of the vendors like the Finax reseller vendors. Here. <laughs> they're so garbage. Like dealing with them is so hard and Amazon is so easy. I'm and, like, guys, there's a blueprint you could use because I hate when we ask for a price on something because it's not it'll listed like call in their system when you log in. And then the sales guy wants to talk to you. And I'm like, I don't want to talk to a sales guy. I want this thing you have. I want to like buy the thing. I want to pay you for the thing. And I want you to ship me the thing. Right. Um, I then you used to be able to get Unify stuff on there, but Unify wanted to push their own market. And where their problem was is people were going to, and that's actually how the price was actually lower than when you used to buy Unify Direct. People would go to like Streak Wave or Ingram Micro or um, Double Radius and buy thousands of them and just go resell them on Amazon. But they were getting a lower price for them because they were just bulk buying them. So they could still put a markup on it and then still sell it cheaper than. Yeah. Ah. Oh, there it is. Brett, Brett heard yeah. me. Cenex, yeah. <laughs> that company that. sucks. I'll call them out publicly. They suck. If you're dealing with them, I'm sorry. They just, there's not a company that can make that harder. Oh, see, I need to get the option to like put the stuff up on the screen. Uh, All right, we'll work on that next time. I'll make yeah. you. Unify stuff is harder to buy than sneakers or Taylor Swift tickets. <laughs> um, we have a client who has like a dozen different Unify accounts. Oh yeah. To get around the limits. Yep. <laughs> yeah, we, we may or may not have gotten in trouble um, ourselves when we ordered from different accounts and they finally wouldn't ship them to us because we were ordering on different names and then shipping them to our office or something. Uh, they realized because they're like, you're paying with the same card. Something like that. And there's other people that are, have dealt with Sinex, so Jeffrey yeah. clearly has dealt with them. <laughs> oh, yeah, and then there's... I hate the Cisco vendor licensing crap. Tried to pay for software support and older firewalls. CW, they can never get it to work between the two companies. Keep pointing fingers at each other. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, and I know he can't... I, my friend can't talk about it publicly, but um, one of the funny things was... We were, I think I, it, my friend was telling me how Cisco tried to reword the word perpetual when they sold a perpetual license or something. And the legal department came back like, you can't reword perpetual. You sent us a renewal on the perpetual license agreement that you sold us. And he says, well, you know, perpetual, it, but it's not perpetual forever. And you're like, oh, no, no. No, that's <laughs> kind of what that word means. Yeah, you can't redefine words in the English language. Sorry, Cisco. <laughs> oh, this is fun. I can ping the AP, but I cannot... Log into said AP. Oh. Boy, we're off to a great start testing this. Let me tell you. Yeah. <laughs> it was working at my place. It worked but... here, but the first time I plugged it in, like I said, it wasn't broadcasting anything. It sat for like five minutes. I did some other stuff around the house, came back, and then started getting curious and realized, oh, there it is now. Yeah, um, use different cards and ship to different addresses. There's ways around it. I mean, yeah, they don't seem to care that all of your email addresses come from the same domain. <laughs> that at least doesn't seem to flag anything that I can find. Uh, so that's like a thing. Um, but, you know, our feelings overall on these, like I think Cisco's making some headway into this. Their Cisco dashboard is garbage, but at least the products all have local web interfaces. So that's the thing. Uh, there's a local web interface that I can't figure out how to get back into. Your 240, I had to use the phone app. Now, the other one I gave you, we haven't tested yet, but I think that one actually, one of them does require a phone app. The minute I, I got to load a phone app, I'm done with it. I don't yeah, even need it. That's where the review stops. have a QR code. The review stops at the, oh yeah, the QR code. Oh yeah, because, so ah, 
me, I'm going to pull these up because uh, so I can show people what I'm talking about here. Let's go 140 AC extenders, extender kit. Oh, unavailable, but here's what it looks like. So we'll share this I tab. Have one. Well, I have it right here so we can show them. So there's your Cisco AP and there's the extender kit. And actually, maybe I've got a closer picture if I could look at it from Cisco. What I want to show people is the stupidity of this. <laughs> I like, hey, there's one on eBay. Let's go visit the one on eBay. <laughs> Here. Ow. They look like this. Except uh, a little less blown on. out, maybe. <laughs> yeah. They're so, literally just like the little, if you've ever seen the little net gate wall plug, that's what they are. They just have a single plug and plug right in and sit on the wall. Yep. Simple. I have a Kensington lock. You could lock it to something, I guess. Yeah. But the part that's so stupid about these is the way you adapt them and the way you um, adopt them, adopt them. Yeah. Is by just putting the Mac address in. That's all you have to do with these is put the Mac address in. The problem is they don't have the Mac address on them. Someone at Cisco is like, hold on. Well, yeah, you got to scan a QR code to get the MAC address. I hate QR codes. Yeah. So you can use a standard QR code extractor, extract all the data. There's more data on the QR code than a MAC address, and then grab the MAC address out of that data that you scanned with your phone. So then you can put the MAC address in the Cisco. And I'm like, why didn't they just print the MAC address on there? So I printed the MAC address and stuck it on there. And I'm like, this is my solution to it. So... I don't understand. Like, the, like that's not a friendly way to do it, Cisco. No, just print the Mac. Every Unify device, I can find the Mac address right on it. Why is it not on this? That It just doesn't make any sense to me. These don't even go for much. I'm looking on eBay right now. Um, nope, that's not the 140 AC. These are all different. I'm going to reboot that because it is just not. Yeah, it's just not showing up. Uh, well, and the other problem is because I cloned all my Wi-Fi to it. I actually don't know if it's broadcasting because technically I would see the ones from my AP. Hmm. Yeah, they're um, currently not available. The the kit, the kit was only like it was under two hundred dollars for the kit. So two extenders and a Cisco one, if they work, are actually pretty good. Like I don't think the the pricing is actually better than reasonable for uh, Cisco. So. You also have to be able to buy them. Yeah. Um, yeah, the extender kits are out of stock, but the 140 AC isn't. Like the 140 AC is um currently available. So and it's not bad. I mean, the I the little bit I played with it so far. The coolest thing I like about it is you can set up a guest network and then um set up a guest user with a password that expires and it will redirect them to a captive portal, ask them to log in. And after they, they can log in, they can get internet, but you can set it. Yeah. This account's only valid for anywhere. I think they said from one minute to one year is what you can set the time frame. So that's cool. When you have like an Airbnb or something and you know, user books, the space, you create the password. The password dissolves after this time, and you don't think about it. Uh, dumb. Uh, isn't the MAC address the same as the BSSID? I, we haven't had time to really examine what it's pulling for that. Um, th it has multiple broadcasts on it, so I don't know which one it is on this system. And it's just weird how you pair them because there's not even, I don't even think there's a reset button on those. That's kind of a security problem. When you there think. Is. is there a reset button on them? It's really tiny and blends into the little ports on the side, but it's okay. There. But you don't touch those to adopt them. They blink one color unadopted and they go solid when adopted. And the way you adopt them is you just drop the Mac address in and they attach. That's it which I thought was just kind of weird. I don't know if that's a security problem where, I mean, it'd be kind of an edge case, but you go grab the Mac address off them and then pop another Cisco and take over someone's adapters. Yeah. I wonder we don't have another Cisco to try it. Cause you'd have to have like the matching AP. 
Right. Yeah, it only works with the one forty NCs. If it's already adopted, can I adopt it again? Yeah. So it's like, well, and this is the other thing. That's a crap show. But saying that if you know the switch port, you can find the MAC address. If your switch can show MAC addresses on a port at least. But these, the extenders don't have network ports. They're nothing. They're Wi-Fi extenders <laughs> with Wi-Fi backhaul. So, yeah, that makes them that much, you know, they're weird. Um, I don't know. I I don't know how well I trust Unify's uh, client isolation versus separate VLAN. I would prefer separate VLAN rather than their isolation, honestly, um, in case there's a mistake made. I mean, I don't know of any problems with it. I'm, you I don't know. You can still get to the gateway, which is a problem. So yeah. technically I could still get to a PFSense login. It's good when you don't have uh, VLAN aware switches or the VLAN functionality. That is a very good thing to implement, but whenever you can, you should use a VLAN. Yeah. So it's kind of, um, I don't know. I would, I, we always build a separate VLAN. Like, even if we check the guest box, we're still putting on a separate VLAN for our own sanity. Say, yeah, the only time we do, the only time we don't do the VLAN is it, again, if the client got an AP cause they just needed wireless, but they don't have any of the other equipment to do VLANs. Right. Which not not too often. Most time, you know, we're going to put in proper infrastructure yeah. for them because proper infrastructure has become much more affordable than before. So, and people are becoming they're, they're more accepting of it. Like, it, you used to get more pushback on, well, why do I need to buy all this? Now they're like, yes, please let me buy all this. Yeah. Um, and I see someone said, you know, stop being cheap. Do Wi-Fi extenders. Um, that are not the way to do. I, I really don't see this as a small business. I see this as a home user thing. Apartments. Um, apartments. Like you can't drill in the walls or anything like that. Pop a couple mm -hmm. extenders in there. Um, done. That's, you know, I think there's a good market for it. That's why I want to try to get the review done. But these are the aggravations I kept running into it. Like it's just a quirky product. And so I started testing it. I got angry and I gave it to Steve. <laughs> and Who's I said, now no. getting angry. Yeah who was also experiencing some of the same weird problems I found with it too. And I just want to make sure it wasn't me. And by the way, I was powering this off a of Cisco switch just so uh, people are clear. It was Cisco switch powering a Cisco wireless because I didn't want a conflict saying, Oh, it's because you plugged it into a Unify switch. I had the same problems with the Unify switch and the Cisco switch for the, um, it being quirky. And, I agree with Veronica here as well. Uh, it's how, with how easy Unify makes VLANs, I've always preferred that their client isolate to the, to their client isolation. I agree. They make it simple in Unify to do. Just do it. Yeah, I have no clue why I can't get into it. It's rebooted and came right up pinging again, and I, I can't log into it still. Huh. Weird. And it, but it's I can even see where I renamed it. Because it shows up in my PF Sense with that name. Oh, so the web interface has decided it's it doesn't want to do no more. Pretty much, I didn't make any. No, I didn't make any network changes to it. I just oh. renamed it. It's all I've pretty much done was rename it, create the SSIDs. Not unless it. I will try it later. Maybe it has some kind of rogue shutoff mode because it sees my other AP. That's that that's would a be stretch. so stupid. That would be stupid, but it, it's a stretch. That's the best I can come up with. It's plugged into my Unify switch. It's powered. It's lit up. It's pinging. It's no longer. Yeah. yeah, we actually can see it. We can ping it, Eric. So we know it's not that we don't know where it is. Well, he's doing saying find the open port, but it oh, should that's... just be 443. That yeah. shouldn't have just moved. And if it did, well, that's a new problem. <laughs> that <laughs> should not happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, hey, I booted today and decided my HTTPS port is 8443. Why? Because <laughs> we we think for security reasons, we're going to randomly rotate what port this is oh, on. That would be wild. <laughs> um, Cisco does stupid UX very well. <laughs> <laughs> Blame Amazon. We didn't buy these on Amazon. Cisco sent me these direct. Yeah. So 
Uh, my dumping on Cisco is coming at brought to you by Cisco because Cisco actually thank David Boombel. So first me and David do a video together about PF sense. Then we do a video about unify. And then he says, Hey Tom, I know he's, he used to do, I he used to work for Cisco. So he goes and does a, um, uh, what do you call it? He does a, uh, connection between me and Cisco and Cisco says, Hey, we'd like Tom to check out our small business lineup. And Tom says, sure. <laughs> and here we are. And that's how Tom did. So far, this did not go well for Cisco. Uh, I'm going to Google what of... the light means. <laughs> oh, is it blinking in color? It's just blinking green. Oh. I tried that too, Eric. But thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, David David has some really good interviews, really uh, good videos on a lot of topics. So... What model was this? The... He's got a great Cisco oh. VLAN uh, hopping video because Cisco does things different than Unify. People always ask about VLAN hopping, and it's so specific. The way you have to get in between the trust models to do it. He's got a video of doing it with Python, how to, how to inject stuff into different VLANs with Cisco. But that same methodology does not work for... Um, uh, unify and actually someone pointed out in his video on that that the way he set it up is not actually a default setting on cisco now i i don't know cisco well enough to answer that question so it sounds like it's not usually how you would configure something so you can still lock these ciscos down properly so success are you giving up i went to the i went to the sheet for it led stages during startup there are Three different green blinks. So, <sighs> blinking green, slow and even, loading drivers and services. Um, blinking green, fast, initial startup, booting kernel. Blinking green, slow flash, finishing startup ready eh, to receive clients. What is slow? <laughs> <laughs> yeah if you don't what have a, a reference versus an even blink what is considered fast uh what fun what fun and the worst part is these have a uh red green amber led they could create a number of combinations to say hey this is what the ap is doing and they just didn't because why so supposedly it's still either on initial startup or loading drivers. I wonder if, did it die because I unplugged it? <laughs> that, that you killed it by unplugging it. Mm. It's your fault, Steve. Probably. <laughs> I literally, all I did, I had it working yesterday, played with it a bit. And then just said, you know what? Let me get the password set up doing my unify because Every time I make a change to the Cisco, I get sick of waiting. So I unplugged it. That that's it. Um, I think this is still a problem for all the Cisco's. Let me look again. One of the bugs you run into is if you try to SSH into some Cisco equipment, they're only supporting the old version of SSH. That was the Cisco small business switches that I'm like. Why do you only have an old version and deprecated um, a deprecated version of SSH, uh, the, the encryption keys? So you had to go into your, I'm using Linux. You had to go and basically remove them. They're, they're blacklisted as in these are so bad and so old, you shouldn't use them. You have to turn them on and basically uh, allow older ciphers to be used on your Linux machine. So you could SSH into your Cisco machine because it didn't support the new cipher. I'm like, this is a new product. This cipher was deprecated in 2016. The product wasn't announced until like 2018 or 2019. So yes, yeah, this goes just got quirkiness to it. Yeah, I might have to reset it. I don't know. I don't know. I'm going to just leave it there plugged in for the next like hour. And we'll see what it does. Yeah, just why are they so silly? You know what, though? This is the same problem we had with um, that Aruba AP the one time. We we unplugged it, 
the client wanted to see if we could reset it. We hit the reset button and it bricked the firmware in the process. And because it was like one of the HP Arubas that you had to have their business level support for, so the firmware is hidden behind some cryptic login, uh, we replaced it with a Unify. Yeah. Um, apply. Oh, where's this? Where's the save icon? I know I have to hit it to make this work. There it is. So you you have to wait till the save icon starts blinking. Yeah, I noticed that on this one too. Yeah, you can't just save it. Like after you do a command, you have to wait. So let's see. I turned it on. Let's see if I can SSH into this and what version of SSH it uses. Or did it did turning SSH on reboot it? This thing is so painfully slow for anyone that didn't know that already. <laughs> Yeah, that's actually probably my core complaint with the AP so far is just how it, the little bit I had it working, it actually seemed to work really well. I thought it was going to be a good product right out the box and then I'll reboot. And now I'm like, oh, this is rough. Yep. Same error. Um, unable to negotiate with. Uh, no matching key exchange method found. So yes, they still use the old key methodologies in here. So that's still a thing. So in case anyone's wondering, I can, we'll share it real quick. Present share screen. Yep. This is the, this is the message you get when you try to log into a Cisco. You have to, um, turn on old key support because they don't support modern keys and modern systems. Eh. Thanks, Cisco. Making my life harder. Aruba's support portal is as painful as HP firmware. I don't know. HP firmware's pain. So much pain. Yeah, we gave up. We couldn't get the firmware for it. We scrapped it. I think it, I think Tom used it as a prop a couple times in videos and it, it says, I think it's gone now. Mm -hmm. Oh, the Aruba one. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's kicking around the shop somewhere. I think we still have one that works, but we had the, the dead one that I think we got rid of. Oh, that's right. Yeah. We had a dead one too. Yeah. That was the one we, it was just bad firmware. We couldn't, you gotta, you know, offer your firstborn child to HP to get the firmware because you bought it in this time frame where we decided this is what we were doing today. Um, I don't know. Uh, let me look. If I can't remember, the, I think there might be a council port on this. I feel like there is. I know you, both of us are tired. <laughs> yeah, I I started playing V Rising, and then I stayed up all night. Yeah, I'm. I am more tired, and I kind of same thing. I didn't didn't sleep as well. So let's stop, present, share screen, Chrome tab. Uh, yes, there's a console port on this. So there's oops, another way to administer it. Um, I don't know. I haven't tried regenerating the key, but it, it's not the key. It's the fact that it's using such an old cipher. I don't know if there's a way to change what cipher it's using. I don't see it here. You'd think this would be an option, but maybe I'm wrong. Maybe eventually the page will open. Yeah, that's the problem I'm having. Yeah. <laughs> Random question. I have a Pop! OS uh, 2204 ACPO, 16 VM, and XUG, when you RDP, my Windows 10 PC, Pop! OS, actually being installed, the mouse delayed, and everything is slower. How to fix this? I have no idea. I never RDP with Pop! OS, so I have no idea. Jay would be a better person to ask from Lauren Linux TV. Keep looking up like did it boot no <laughs> incompatible cisco port key algorithms yeah <laughs> yeah brett's been driving for you brett's traveling today so 
Well, these don't have a uh, console port. Now, the the next model up that's still sitting upstairs that I haven't got to yet, those actually do have a USB, I think, USB-C console port. Yeah, that's actually right. I think they do have that. I think you're right on that. Yeah. I remember I popped the little plastic cover off on it. But these ones don't have anything. Not unless it's like... But eh, I was going to say, not unless it's hidden back here, but then this plug comes off and I can't turn it on. So how do I console into it? Yeah, I no idea. Just stupid. All right. Uh, Cisco are now in a void, are, are now my avoid list with 48 QNAP and Dell switches. Like QNAP as a whole or QNAP switches? Um, do they make switches? Yeah, QNAP does make some switches. I don't really? know if they're any good. We had somebody with the Synology switches before. It's their switches. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I think Synology made switches. I think they make some networking equipment or they, or they make a firewall or something. They make firewall. Yeah. Yeah. I've never used it. And they asked me if I want to review it. And I was like, no. Yes. I would no. try it. I, what's it cost? I guess is the big question. It just looks so basic. It, let me pull it up for you. Um, I don't understand why they got into this market. That's basically what I don't understand. Dell doesn't make a switch. Dell is a rebranded whoever sold them the cheapest thing that day. Yeah. Pretty much. I have a Nintendo Switch. Did Sanji get rid of these? I'm Googling Sanji Firewall and it's not showing up. Maybe they did. I don't I don't Are think they just they were continued on... already. I say I don't think they were a high selling product. No, they were never I can't I, I, I Googled it and it doesn't actually come up. Uh, interesting. It comes up with a help page of how to configure your Synology's firewall. What was their so share this tab. I was going to say, they still have all the support pages for them. I see them from time to yeah, time. Yeah, there we go. I've never seen the... I mean, tell me it doesn't look like it's just a fancier like Linksys. Like, it's... it. I like it. I want to demo that. I don't Actually, think go up. That doesn't look half bad. Go, like, go back to those specs. Wi-Fi 6 mesh. Yeah, they don't... They're not bad. They even have two five gig WAN ports. 2.5 gig ETH. Dual gigabit, 2.5 gig dual WAN. Now, what's the cost on something like this? That actually doesn't seem too awful. 219. Wow, that's... I don't know. I don't look at home routers much, so I don't know if that's a good price. Yeah. It doesn't seem awful, though, for having 2.5 gig support and Wi-Fi 6. I mean, and it people, seems like it. There's, there's people out there buying Orbeez. Yeah. At 200 bucks a pop. For way worse of a product. Yeah, so, I mean, there's that. What's the, they're that enhanced. Means, the, hmm? They have the AC model. The antennas are on the outside. Does that make it better? 149. I, I have to admit, I feel it does. <laughs> I like I've it better. Never had a router with antennas on the inside that I've been like, man, the range is impressive. Hmm. Only if they're giving us one for free, I'll test it and then give it to someone. They have a pretty website. 119 for their MR220. So that's really cheap. Yeah, but now you're back in AC five gigahertz. Yeah. But still, I mean, it's, you know. They <laughs> want me to get one for the office? No. Like I said, I wouldn't be opposed to testing one. Yeah. And I'm just reading all these comments. <laughs> yeah. Um... On XCMG, what's your backup schedule? Delta every day, full backup every week. Uh, yeah, pretty much. I think that AP's broke. It's just it's broken. Still blink it is still blinking. Yep. So I'm going to call it dead and uh, reset it later. Oh, I didn't know Willie Howe had reviewed it. I'll have to look.
Uh, the Shannon is really not better on the outside uh, when they have independent power. Yeah, I mean, ultimately it comes down to the architecture because uh, <laughs> call it Abe Blinken. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it comes down to architecture. You look at the uh, Unify stuff. You're, there's no external antennas on these flat Unify ones, you know, little flying saucer looking things, but boy, they work good. <laughs> so... I mean, I have Wi-Fi out in my yard, and I don't have any antennas. Yeah, but they it. they actually put good antennas in there. Yeah, the we've taken them apart. They look really cool inside. Yeah, most of the most of the router manufacturers, especially the home ones, when you break them open, they're just the little diode antennas you find in a laptop. Versus the Unifies are like they're this like they're what that big, and there was a big array of them on the uh, stadium. Hmm. So yeah, uh, they, they have a bunch of the arrays on there. I'm gonna wind this down. I think it's six because I'm I'm yawning. <laughs> Why are there fifteen hundred dollar for three Orbeez? What? I didn't even know they made them like past two hundred dollars. They're that exciting. I have no idea what they cost. Uh, they used to be two. Uh, they had them at Office Depot. Two hundred dollars for one or a pair for three hundred, so you can mesh some stuff. Or I think a pair was like three fifty or four for five hundred or four fifty. Like, yeah, I mean, neck gear or ye or they came down a bit. It looks like you can get some of the these are all oh, these are used ones for one oh nine. Okay. Yeah, there you go. Wi Fi six three hundred and fifty a piece. Yeah, I just don't have time. People ask me every now and then about like the home equipment. I don't have time to look at it. No, don't buy them. They're no, I don't want we did to. did it years either. ago. It's I did one for a client. I wasn't that impressed. Yep. They could have literally thrown the Orbi system out, put in one Unify access point, and had the same coverage. The most secure way to replicate ZFS. Um, over a VPN. I, I, that's kind of a... I mean, when you replicate ZFS... It's not really a security thing. You're just replicating data. I mean, don't do it across the public internet. Do it across the VPN if you're dealing with a remote site. So I need more context to be able to answer that question better. Uh, Nick, your lawsuit, he first used Windows only uh, client on Switch Config. It was years ago, but still annoyed. Um, yeah, there's a few companies that did things like that. They used to, Cisco, didn't Cisco in the early days, make you use some stupid Java client to be able to update anything on their switches. It's like you just went back to the command line because that was the yeah. way to do it. Yeah. I don't know. I, I don't know. I went from command line Cisco to wait, this is stupid. Use Unify. <laughs> yeah. Um, I have a video on using TrueNAS to prevent ransomware. It can extend to the ZFS because it's just a matter of setting up snapshots. But I have a video covering that as a topic. I cover it both for Synology and for TrueNAS. And it's not that it makes you impervious to ransomware. It just allows you to restore the snapshots. Without having to worry about the snapshots being part of what got destroyed. Uh, all right, cool. Those messages were not for me. Hmm. Where's the other one here? And why are we yawning so much? <laughs> I'm not. No. Oh, I thought I heard you yawn. <laughs> no, I was looking over and still being frustrated with that switch or the AP. Well, doing it live has failed us. Now, yeah, now yeah, I'm. I'm going to reset it. Weird. That is weird. It died. It's just so weird, though, because like I said, I, I actually had things connected to it and used it for a little bit yesterday. And I used it for a while. when I, Without the extenders, I used it for like a week. Maybe. I had it working with the extenders. I just didn't have uh, the password net to test the WPA 2 and 3.
Ah. Fun stuff. It's camera shy. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's it. I think oh, it might man. be in a boot loop. Yeah. Um, are you using two smartphones for OTP codes for work or personal related? Um, no, I don't use my, we'll go a step further. I don't use my password manager on my phone. That is, um, don't do that. Another step. Like I don't put it on there because my OTP codes are on my phone. I don't, honestly, I don't even consider my phone for personal use. There's not Facebook or things on my phone either. Cause I actually don't like using a phone that much. So it's kind of just a business thing. Um, and so there's OTP codes on my phone uh, that are also secured. I'm using um, Aegis uh, for that. They're locked. You need biometrics or a password to unlock the OTP codes, but there's no other passwords on my phone. So that creates a level of inconvenience, but such is life. Oh man, yep. fun stuff. Did it, did it boot at all? No, I'm. I gotta find. Because uh... I'm also I haven't eaten, so it's... <laughs> go eat. I don't know, man. Yeah. I, I was just saying I might wind this down. <laughs> I'm gonna reset it. That's that. I've resigned myself to it's getting reset now. Yeah, because I think it. I noticed the light kind of fluctuate, blinking a couple times. I think it's stuck. Which is concerning. Yeah, Aegis is an open source um, tool that you can get. It's sorry for people that are using iPhone; it's not available. I guess the new question is, how do you reset this thing? Because that uh, yeah, button says know. "mode," not "reset." Fun stuff. Yeah, I, this is back to OTP. But if I need to store OT for personal OTP for work, should use two different apps uh, to have separation. I mean, I don't think um, having personal OTP, OTP, I mean, would I allow it? No, I mean, for it's kind of fuzzy. It, it's because I don't think of too many things that have personal OTP because some of the personal sites, and I guess I just don't have any personal sites I go to that have OTP. Um, Twitter does, I, you know, is Twitter personal or business for me? I can't tell. So I, what is the, the potential risk though? Yeah. Um, like, I don't think it's a big deal. If, if Steve has his, uh, personal Gmail OTPT and his business Gmail OTP using Aegis, I don't think that's a big deal on his phone. Like, yeah. Cause you're not, what's the attack vector, right? What is the best hardware workplace for uh, Google Workspace? Um, I don't actually have a problem with both the YubiKey or either the YubiKey or the, um, uh, what's the other one I used? I did a video. If you type in Fido, I did a video on another Fido key. Both of them are fine because they're both part of the Fi uh, Fido organization. So it's not really a best. They both work fine. is the name of that other one trust key so the trust key works fine too it's it trust key is part of the fido alliance uh don't rate the google auth versus aegis i don't know Use the YubiKey for OT, holds the key, and can get with any device that you need. Yeah, YubiKeys are good. Um, I just mentioned one of these because people are asking if there was an alternative. I tested it. It works fine. I didn't have any issues with it. Um, so that one's pretty good. Yeah, trust key. I thought using OTP apps was bad. If the phone dies or OTP dies, someone could hack the account, which is much worse. 
I mean, someone needs to be able to grab your phone and have your username and password. So they need both things. So it depends on what's your threat level. Are you a CIA operative and there's someone after you? So then they're going to use a wrench. Yeah. They're just going to beat you with a wrench until you unlock your phone. <laughs> That's the more likely scenario you'll run into. Which, which whoever X, uh, we'll just pull up that XKCD for those that don't get the joke. Eat, Eat him with this wrench. There is the a crypto nerd's imagination. His laptop is encrypted. Let's build a million dollar cluster to crack it. No, we can't do it. What actually happens? His laptop's encrypted. Drug him and hit him with this five dollar wrench until he tells me what the password is. Yep. Yeah. What was uh, the other thing we were going to talk about? What was the other thing we were talking about? I seems well, like we did have something else. Cisco, the Sentinel One, and Cisco's fun so far. Yeah. Hey, it's so, it's solid green. Oh, okay. After a reset, I don't know if the reset took. I was supposed to hold it for twenty seconds. I didn't. Hmm. Well, that's fascinating. It was solid green right up until I hit enter on the web browser to refresh the page. Now it's blinking again. Um, how can you bypass uh, XCB backup encrypted? You can't. You don't. You can't. If you have an encrypted VM, you're not going to run those tests, uh, automated tests on it because you got to type a password in. So if you if you got a boot password on there, sorry about your luck. Um you're, you're not going to be able to do it. You cannot shut down that VM without typing the password in. This is the trade-off with security. Mm -hmm. If you set a VM, so a VM that has a password on each boot, then it's going to have a password on each boot. You're not going to restore it automatically. That's it, It's not It's not an option. It'll so, restore. It just won't boot. Right. You're going to be stuck at that password screen. Let's talk about workarounds. This is a Linux workaround, not a Windows one. You could, in theory... And there are, I don't, maybe there's a way to do it in Windows, but at least I'm a, there is ways to do this in Linux. You can set up a key server. Let's say that key server is a, a Raspberry Pi. It can be anything on your network. And what you do is you have the Linux machine reach out to the key server. You can find some write-ups on how to do this. If it finds said key server, the key server issues the unlock command and the VM boots. But if someone steals your backup, and they load it on their home machine or wherever they're loading it uh, and try to boot it up, the key server won't exist on their network, so it won't boot up. It doesn't have the password. The good and bad, you have to set all this up and it has to work well, um, and hopefully your key server stays online or your VMs won't go online. Next, the real challenge is making sure they don't steal the key server as well. So if someone gets a hold of the key server, then they, you know, they've got it then. So you're, you're just kicking the can down the road on there. So either you have encryption and you don't want anyone to unlock it without knowing the password, or you create a key server that can be talked to um, and do this. And those are your options. Another option, kind of a side option is you can separate your data and OS and then allow the OS to boot, but not the data part to be mounted because it's encrypted at rest. For example, let's say I boot up a VM and it mounts an iSCSI extent. And that iSCSI extent is where the treasure is. So the OS, if you stole it, you wouldn't steal the iSCSI extent where the treasure is, the data you're looking for. Um, that would allow it to work as well. So there's another way to do it. Same thing with TrueNAS encrypted drives because... Um, that's a, uh, with the TrueNAS encrypted drives, people say, I want my TrueNAS to boot without a password, but I want it to be absolutely secured. I'm like, I'm sorry. If they want someone not to be able to extract the keys, I'm like, they're going to, if, if you, 
have the keys on the server and someone physically takes the server um, and it doesn't require a password, there's not a way to really make that work. Um, hey, Tom, I just finished watching, listening to your S1 Huntress detection video. Do you think Threat Locker would have prevented this by not allowing all those connections? Uh, do you guys use Threat Locker? We do not. And Threat Locker is an entirely different conversation because um, it, it becomes a management nightmare. If you have time, you have a client that's willing to pay you to manage it. And you have, and this comes down to the client. If you have a client that has a diverse amount of software, uh, I talked to an MSP recently and they had to remove Threat Locker from their accounting firms because the accounting software just was too much of a pain to keep up with Threat Locker. Too many. They get an update like every week. Yeah. And every time they updated, and for those of you not familiar with it, Threat Locker is a whitelisting program that says only these programs can run. There's other companies that do it. Airlock Digital is another one. Um, I've thought about evaluating because I think they've got an interesting uh, product. They're, um, they've done some reviews over on Patrick Gray from Risky Business. He's friends with the people over there. I've looked at some of these, but they always come down to management. I mean, can you lock computers down to an entire whitelist of only the software it's allowed to run? Yes, until there's a minor update for that software and it doesn't run, then it's going to flag it. And then you're going to go, OK, I got to allow this software to run. So you're constantly investigating it. It's just as tedious. So it comes down to time it takes to do it. And Eric's got the best answer right here. If you just want to bypass the encryption, just use that NSA backdoor. <laughs> yeah, so. Hopefully that makes sense. Needs a full-time babysitter. Yeah. I've talked to several MSPs. It's just one of those things like whitelisting is the holy grail that we all want to get to, but it's not, it's, it's just man. not, especially like Steve mentioning some of the manufacturing clients that we talked about earlier, mm -hmm. man, they run a bunch of weird software. Yeah. It's stuff that gets flagged by security tools. Cause it's weird software and telling companies that have weird software that they can't run weird software are challenging. Um, or even, you know, the look at the big push. We have clients. Hold on. My monitor is like off by like a degree and it upset me. Um, we have clients who use QuickBooks and as more things used to move to web apps, it becomes more viable, but we got clients who can't move to QuickBooks online because the online version doesn't do what the manufacturing version does. We have, and then you also have the holdouts of, well, we've used this software for years. We can't just change a process. Yeah. So it's not easy. I, I think it's mostly used. I think it's a really good fit for newer, younger companies where you have a lot of web apps. Yeah. And it's actually, uh, we have clients that you could you could lock their computers down because everything they use is a, a series of web apps they have. They wouldn't know you locked them down. They don't open anything on their computers. Oh, I we mean, got they, clients who... At that point, just get them a Chromebook. Uh, we have a client who we actually... A few clients we did that for. Like, yeah. wait, everything you do is online. Get a Chromebook. Yep. Uh, we have that one. There's some. There's a company that does um, gutters and they can use Chromebooks because they don't use any applications. So it's weird to think that a company in that space would be mm -hmm. able to do it, but they can. They just bought this cool app that does everything in a web interface so they can just use. The only computer that uses uh, a couple computers is they have a couple of accounting people that use like QuickBooks, but the most of the staff can use a Chromebook. They're using um, the old Chrome box even hooked up to a big touchscreen TV. And that's they just drag appointments around like this truck has to be at this house to put those up. Yep. Uh, when, what do you think about setting up TPM to unlock full encryption on drives and laptops and since instead of taking a password? Yeah, TPM is another option. Yeah. Um, it just depends on where you're threat modeling for. If you want to use it, you know, you want to unlock it to TPM. That doesn't solve someone physically stealing your server. So if your threat model is not physically stealing the server, awesome. You can use TPM to unlock it. Um, you know, just it, it comes down to what your inconvenience level. Security is all about trade-offs. Being really secure is deeply inconvenient of typing in these silly passwords, but <laughs> is your worry that someone will get a hold of your backups and then load them on their system and extract the uh, things they want out of them. So yeah, QuickBooks could take down the USA and economy. Ah, I think it's dragging it down to some extent because God, I hate that software. Yeah. But, you know, it's an interesting thing. If there was ever a supply chain tech against QuickBooks, it would cripple small businesses across America. Maybe. Because uh, how many small older, businesses? 
older small businesses. Yeah. But then again, how many small businesses are updating to the latest version of QuickBooks? I look <laughs> at our mechanic do. who's still on like 2004 mm -hmm. on the computer without internet. <laughs> yeah. Uh, web apps are great until the internet goes out. Yeah. The reality is that's fail over internet. I just set up a, yeah. we had a client that happened to. Um, when we had all the power outages, their internet was out. They were running with cellular hotspots. And then he's like, wait, couldn't I just buy one of these and have the firewall do it and take care of everything? And I said, yes. So he went out and bought one and I just set it up. Yep. And this is not a realistic statement anymore because um, the way people build the web apps now and everything else, it's the reality is we have clients who have local servers with local stuff on there. You know what they do when the internet goes out? Twiddle their thumbs because they can't call, mm -hmm. they can't email, they can't send quotes to get things done. So it's the internet has become not like I need, I want it. It's, it's like I need it to do my job, to make the phone calls, to send the email, to conduct business. It almost doesn't matter if the app is in the cloud because if you don't have the internets, you can't go anywhere. By the way, a lot of people, because they work from home, lots of professional services, that's something they'll go do now. They're like, oh, the internet's out. I'm going to go home and use the internet to connect yep. to our uh, app. Matter of fact, when the internet has gone out at branches where my wife works, she just is like, cool, I can just work from home. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the only people who really can't do it, we have some people who do like large CAD designs and the files are just so massive. It's not practical to do it out of the office. But even then they can, if their internet goes out, they just can't make phone calls or send emails. They can still work. Yeah. The, um, uh, this is what's on in, this is what it comes down to, you know, security. I'll say security is a bunch of trade-offs example being threat locker in theory, threat locker seeing I prevent many issues with management. I mean, in theory, it's, it comes down to budget. You you could always say sell the client everything, and the client has to weigh this out of, okay, I can get all these things. How much is it going to cost? And then you're like, oh, because it takes this many of our staff to manage your system. Here's your cost. And they're like, we just don't make enough money to, to, to make that viable. They have to work in how to increase the cost of whatever widgets they make or product they sell to justify how much more IT would cost. It just becomes very... Um, the huge and, and cost is you know cost is one factor but then you also have the workflow disruption factor yep people end users and non-technical people will trade off security all day for convenience and they're going to view hey i have to call the it guys because there's a quickbooks update as an inconvenience that's why so many companies so many places have computers with the user having local admin because yep. they don't want to have to make a ticket, call someone just to, yeah, Chrome needed an update or QuickBooks has to load this update. Yeah, it's it's always figuring out the trade-offs. Um, are you using Zora for a PF blocker? And I see Eric answered this, but yeah, Zora's is uh, something we use for business. PF blocker is more for personal. Uh, what's like a widget? Talk about, oh, <laughs> uh, what's a widget? What's a uh, it is my, and it could be, I'm, I'm guessing maybe you're not a native English speaker. I don't know. Um, widget is the, is the generic term for whatever a company makes. Um, I don't know what they make, or I'm not being specific about what they make. So we'll just say they make widgets. Where um, was that term first used, I wonder? That's a good question. Like, I'm thinking about the oldest instant that I could, and that exactly that question, what's a widget? Um, what was that movie with Rodney Dangerfield? Back to school. Where he's in the business class and you're opening up a business making widgets. And he's like, what's a widget? Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, we will conclude this the Cisco stuff at some point in time when we actually get it working yeah. properly. I, I was excited to test it this weekend. I'm going to try to test it this weekend. I just got a longer cable so that I can reset it. Yeah. Oh, good. He was actually quoting that. <laughs> oh, okay. Got it. Yes. Back to school. I Rodney love that movie. Boy, that's an old movie. Oh, 1986. Was I wasn't it? even born yet. <laughs> <laughs> if it works. Yeah, we're, we're, we're to the if it works part of this portion, Eric. I'm not happy about it. Yeah. On site now. Uh... 
Oh yeah. It is just uh as I was right, you don't make easy by needing updates. It's just a mess. I was 10. Uh yeah, that's, that's about the age I was. And so Marty were the same age. Watch. <laughs> so all right. Well, thanks everyone for joining us. Sorry we didn't get to show you the Cisco, but we kind of did review it. <laughs> we showed it physically. I I held it up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I am it, hungry. It, and uh and it's a shame because I, like I said, my initial tests with it were going really well. And it went well until it didn't. So now we're curious what makes this happen. Like, did the firmware get borked from unplugging it? That that shouldn't be. It shouldn't be. But I mean, this is. You see it? This That's it. That's all it's been doing. <laughs> you saw the Cisco folks. Move along. Nothing yeah. to see here. Literally, <laughs> it won't boot up. <laughs> My experience is a glaring review of Cisco. Kind of is. Kind yeah. of is. <laughs> and the other one might be cut short too if I plug it in and it's, hey, go get our app and use your phone. No thanks. Yeah, we don't need a phone app for that. That is just. <sighs> I remember I was out with Holly and we went to a restaurant and I just lost it because I'm like, where's your menu? And they just point to the side and I'm like, it's a QR code. And I'm like, <sighs> you're a food truck with five items. Come on. <laughs> Um, you know, I'll pull this up. This is my uh, back scratcher for anyone wondering that NetGate sent me. By the way, swag. If you want Tom to have swag that he will fidget with and play with and use, it's a back scratcher. It just this thing is stupidly fun. <laughs> so I don't. Oops, sorry. <laughs> that probably came through the mic. Um, yes, this little thing is stupid fun. They sent us a few of them. This has been my favorite swag thing I've gotten in a while. I don't know if I got anxious or if it's actually breaking when I go to log in. Same uh, thing. Someone said that... the Cisco 240 AC uses phone app only. Okay. And that's the other one, isn't it? What's the other one? A 240? It's a 150 AC. Okay. So, all right. Well, now it's red. So I think it's trying to do something. Uh, we have a few of these at the shop, Eric. So you can come get one. So next time you're at the office there, come get your NetGate. NetGate scratches my back. <laughs> now that he moved his mic in shot at the start. Yeah, I always, I always move it. It's yeah. not the same place ever. Because I, I, um, I only bring it in. I bring it in for videos. And when I'm done doing the way I record for these, um, I have a shotgun mic I record. That's, you've noticed this is not in my videos that I do for YouTube. Uh, so this is only here when I do live streams. I know I'm trying to get mine so that I can get it in shot and get the LEDs on the back working. A 16, a 16, a lot of change. I can't see these days. If anything more, yeah, challenging. For sure. I'm going to go eat some pizza. Neat. Um, I'm going to try to fix an AP and play V Rising and talk to Eric. What if we buy some random ice? We need some swag. Oh, that's the knife I wanted to talk about. I'll talk about it next vlog Thursday. Maybe I'll have them. I made new shirts. I get I got a couple more. I'm uploading. I came up with some new designs. So, and I'm going to do a new shirt a new shirt order. I actually ordered a handful of their samples and stuff, uh, but I'll get some for the staff as well. I just want to see how they turn out first because it's new designs. But uh, so I'll be mentioning that there. Our shirt store is linked in all of our videos. So if you're looking for any of the shirts that we have, uh. Like my Colt ZFS shirt I'm wearing right now. But we're also going to make some, uh, I have some mugs and stickers. Um, let's pull it up before I go here. Where is my Teespring store link? I got to look at my own videos to find it. I think that's how this works. I don't remember the link to it. I know where it's at though. I'll pull up the new shirt. We'll leave people with that so they have something to look at. I, I forgot. I did the other shirt and I forgot to upload it. Um, we had our cat shirts. We have... Uh, this is the one that I think is kind of cool that someone might like. My cloud is 127001. So my cloud is at home. I figure that resonates with the audience I have here. Uh, we also made a mug out of it. Made a mug, a sticker, but I have a couple more uploads I'm going to do. 
We do have a Cat 6 mug, too. So if you need six cats on a mug, we got it. And I'll leave you with this one. This is still a favorite. Working with strippers all day keeps your crimp hands strong. I miss the NAS one. Oh, yeah, I'm going to work on a new one of that. So, yeah, so we have these shirts in our shirt store. Um, Corey loves that shirt. Yeah. <laughs> and Bash, <laughs> I think we have one that says Bash the like button, too. So I thought we had stickers for that. Maybe we did. We do. Bash that like button. There we go. <laughs> I got to do a better job of advertising that we have a swag store. And we do have this one here. Just says, keep your crimp hands strong. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I got to go and post these again. I thought this one was funny, but I, it isn't really sold well. I guess I'm the one who likes it. Yeah. <laughs> condensed New England clam routers. I don't know why that is so funny to me. I'm the only one who's funny too. I get it. That's all right, though. I like these shirts too. The little running, what you call it? Yeah. Guy. These are not bad. Um, da -da -da. All right. Cool. Yeah. Eric likes the hoodie. I think Eric, we, yeah, we, at some point we need to get you a new hoodie as well. Probably. We'll work on all that. Thanks everyone for joining. This was fun and uh, <laughs> see you next week. And maybe if I feel inspired over the weekend. Yeah. I'll try to get this working. Maybe we'll have more news of the Cisco and it works. Yeah. If we get it working, maybe we'll do something over the weekend and talk about it. I, we got to get it. working. I am actually legitimately kind of frustrated because I really, I was excited for this and now I'm not, <laughs> I'm disappointed. <laughs> We've, you've disappointed us, Cisco. We'll leave you guys with that. Take yeah. care.